Grace and peace to you from God, our Creator, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning, and welcome to online worship with Orange Beach Presbyterian Church. My name is Kim, I'm the pastor here, and what a joy it is to gather to worship God together this morning. Quick announcement before we begin worship. Uh, first announcement is that the fish fry that we had this week was a huge success. I just have to be, have a big shout out of thank yous to everyone who helped. Uh, we had people show up early and help move tables and chairs. We had people bring food. We had folks from Trinity Presbyterian Church over in Fairhope. They came, they brought the fish, they fried it all. Um, they do that every year to help with our fish fry and we could not do it without them. So thank you to all the good people at Trinity who made that happen. Um, we had people help clean up afterward. And of course we had lots of people come through the doors, make a donation and eat some great fish. Right now our total stands at $2,133, all of which is going to the Presbyterian Home for Children. If you would like to make a donation and you haven't yet done so, it's not too late. Uh, through today, we're gonna continue collecting. We will cut a check Monday and send that off to the Children's Home. Um, so you can go online, just go to our website, orangebeachpresbyterian.org, and right on the front page, there's a little button that says Give Now. Click on that give whatever amount you would like to give and then there's a place where you can write a note make sure in that note you just write children's home or fish fry uh, either one will let us know where that money is going and we will announce the grand total when we um, write the check and get that sent off on monday next announcement is a week from today is a communion sunday it'll be the first sunday in april uh, if you um, are going to be worshiping online with us a week from today be sure to have communion ready. That means bread, crackers, something along those lines, and a cup of juice or wine, uh, something set up right where you worship so that when it comes time to gather around the Lord's table, you will be ready and be able to gather with us and share in the Lord's Supper. Those are our announcements, and now we will begin worship. All of the words that you will need will be found right on your screen as you need them. The words to the prayers, the hymns, the responses, everything. And we will begin with our call to worship. God is calling you today. Help us to hear God's call in our lives. God needs your gifts and graces to help others. May we use the blessings which God has given us to benefit others. Come, let us worship and celebrate God's love for us. Let us show our faithfulness in our words and actions. Amen.
Let us go now into a time of confession. We'll pray first silently and then together in the prayer found on your screen. We can pray with confidence, knowing that our prayer of confession will be followed by the assurance of pardon. Let us pray. And let us pray together. How often, O Lord, have we believed that the greatest commandment is our love for ourselves solely. We have not heard the cries of those in need. We have turned our backs on opportunities to serve you by serving others. Many times we have thought only of our own wants and desires and ignored the needs of others. Help us to truly understand the commandments to love you with all our heart soul, strength, and mind. Let us care for our neighbors both far and near. Bring us back to your loving light. For we ask these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In the midst of darkness, the bright light of God's love shines through, healing our anguished souls. Rejoice, for God's love and forgiveness are given to us this day. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Before we hear God's written word, let us turn to God in prayer. Gracious God, Lord, how we thank you for this day. We thank you that we get to worship you again, another Sunday gathered near and far with our siblings in Christ, to sing your songs, to pray to you, and to hear your word. Lord, as we hear your written word today, we pray that you will fill us with your Holy Spirit, opening our ears, our hearts, and our minds, so that we will recognize your voice as you call out to us. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, as together we pray how he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson today comes from the book of Luke, chapter 15, verses 1 through 3, and then picking up with verse 11. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. 
So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomachs with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, put the best robe, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, come home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. parable of the prodigal child, the one who left and returned. Last week, we talked about being lost and then being 
found. Preceding this parable, we have the parable of the great banquet where people sit and feast and eat. And then we are warned about the cost of being a disciple. And then we hear the lost sheep, the one sheep which left and the shepherd goes out and finds that sheep and returns it to the flock. The parable of the lost coin, the woman who has 10 coins but loses one and tears apart the house until she finds it. The lost coin found, claimed, brought back. And now the parable of the lost son. It's a lengthier parable. There are more details. There are more characters here for us to look at and identify with. The parable of the lost sheep, it's sheep and a shepherd. The parable of the lost coin, it's an inanimate object and a woman who searches for it. But the parable of the prodigal child, the lost child, this has some characters. We have the two children, the two sons, and we have the father. And it's somewhat complicated and complex. But it's fascinating to look at these characters, to look at the mercy of God, to look at God's joy at a sinner's repentance, to look at how God seeks us out and accepts us back with open arms and expressions of joy. Perhaps the father in the parable is God and the active role that God plays in the grace God offers to all of us, the prodigal longing to come home. Now, this tale, this parable, it begins with the son with his hand outstretched, give me my inheritance. A kid with his hand out making demands. It's a little bit uh, surprising, given the cultural context. Jewish law dictated that when a father died, the older son would get two-thirds of the estate, a double portion, and then the next youngest son would get one-third. But dad hasn't died. Dad is alive and well. So when the younger son asks for his inheritance, He's basically saying, you know, you're going to die someday anyway. How about give me what I've got coming now so that I can enjoy it now? And he gets it. His father agrees to give him his inheritance, his double portion. And he takes it, and then he takes off. He goes to a foreign country, a Gentile country. And he enjoys his inheritance. He lives large for a little bit. He's happy to have this money, and he is spending it apparently without thought of how he will have money in the future because the money runs out. He squanders all of the property by living this wild and fun lifestyle. So he blows it all. He's flat broke. They're now in the middle of a famine, and he hires him out to a Gentile pig farmer. This is about as un-Jewish as you can get. Pigs are an abomination to Jews. People who cared for pigs were considered cursed. We have this young man. He's hungry. He's destitute. And he's sitting in the filth of a pigsty. He's so hungry, he could eat what the pigs are eating. Nobody is giving him anything. And here, in the depths of where he is, the deepest valley this man has ever been in, the only time in his life that this person has ever been this broken, this hungry, this destitute, In the middle of this, he has a revelation. He decides to go home. It's a wonderful 
beginning of repentance driven there by the circumstances, the terrible circumstances. He's gone as low as he can. He is starving, probably almost to death. And he says, it's time to come home. And he doesn't just say it's time to come home with no plan whatsoever. He's thought about it. I mean, my, the people who work for my dad have more food than I have. His servants, his workers are eating well, and I am starving to death. I'm going to go back to my father and I'll say to him, I've sinned against heaven and against you. He's going to go back. He's going to admit that he screwed up. He's going to tell him, hey, look, I'm not, not even worthy. And then he's going to ask if he can work for him. He doesn't even expect to be welcomed back as a son. All he wants is the chance to be in his father's house again. All he wants is a chance to be one of the hired men on the property, because at least then he will eat. So he starts getting home. He starts the travel. He leaves this far country to return home. It doesn't tell us how long it took him to travel back. It doesn't tell us even how he traveled, but remember he had no money. He was at the mercy of others and his own two feet to bring him home. I wonder if as he got closer and closer, he got more and more nervous. I wonder if he was imagining how he would beg or the things he would say. I wonder if he was afraid that he would ask for his father's forgiveness and not receive it if he would be turned away hungry because he finally recognized what he did, asking his father for an inheritance while his father was still alive and then taking that money and leaving him behind. I wonder if he ever thought of his brother, that next oldest, who would have only gotten a third of the estate and was left behind to work? Did he even give him any thought at all? Scripture doesn't tell us. We don't know. We're just left to speculate. So the son is walking back. And what do you know? He was still a long way off when his father saw him. He's coming toward the house. The father looks into the distance. I have to wonder how often the father looked into the distance. If you look at the previous parables, the lost coin where the woman turned the house upside down looking for him, and the lost sheep where the shepherd left the whole flock to go out and find the sheep that had wandered off, I would imagine the father probably was looking every day I wonder how many times the father would see somebody in the distance and squint and say, is that my son? Is he finally coming back? Perhaps he was still looking every day. Perhaps he had given up. We don't know. Again, we're left to speculate. We're left with this story to imagine exactly what is happening. But he sees his son. He knows that it is him. And while he's still a long way off, the father is filled with compassion and he doesn't just wait for his son with open arms, which really would make for a loving and wonderful, warm story. He doesn't just start walking to go meet him. He doesn't send one of his hired hands to go out and escort him back. He runs. He runs to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. And that's not it. There's more. He runs to him. He hugs him. He kisses him. And then he says, 
let's have a party. As he's hugging him, as he's kissing him, the son said to him, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He's giving this apology that he's been thinking about and planning. He's saying the very words that he had planned on saying. He is asking for forgiveness. And the father responds by saying to his servants, bring the best robe. Put a ring on his fingers, put sandals on his feet, bring the fattened calf. Let's have a feast and celebrate this son of mine, this one, the one who asked for my inheritance, demanded my inheritance, took it and left. The one who squandered it, the one who is skinny, probably near death. He was dead because he was no longer part of my life, but he has returned, he is found. And they began to celebrate. And now here's where we get to see the other character in this parable, the older son. The older son doesn't even know what's going on. He's out there in the field working. He's not even in the house letting the hired hands do the work. He's out there with them. He's out in the field. But when he comes near the house, he can hear the music and the dancing. And he says, what is happening? What's going on? The servant knows before the brother even does. Hey, your brothers come home. Your father has killed the fattened calf. He has them back. We're celebrating. We're going to have a party. And whoo, the older brother is angry. He refused to even go in the house. So the father went out and talked with him. He pleaded with him. It doesn't tell us exactly what he says. I mean, I've got multiple children. I would imagine if one left and came back, I can imagine what I would say to the child who was angry about the celebration. I mean, I can imagine because my two younger kids, William and Haley, when they were younger, they used to always think that the other one had it better. Whatever was happening, the other one had it better than they did. The other one always got in trouble and the other one never got in trouble and they always did. The other one always got the best of everything and I always got the, the short end of the stick. And it wasn't just one child constantly saying this to me, it was both of them. They, each child always thought the other was being treated more fairly or more generously or got, got the better things or the lesser punishment or whatever it was. There was always a little bit of that back and forth between the two siblings. And so, and here it is here too. He says, come on, this guy, he demanded your money. He took it, he left with it. He obviously doesn't have it anymore because he's come back and now you're celebrating with him. I've never done that. I've always done the right thing. I've been here at your side. I haven't left your house. Where's my fattened calf? Where's my party for my friends? You know, I, I get it. I understand where he is coming from. And the answer to this son is you are always with me. Everything I have is yours. So now you have these two different sons one of whom left, squandered everything, and returned to a joyous celebration and the Father's love, the other who stayed the whole time enjoying the Father's love in a different way. The son who stayed had the steadfast, faithful, everyday love and care of the Father. The other one lost it for a while walked away from it, chose to walk away from it, and suffered. I mean, yeah, had a little bit of fun, but then was starving, living with pigs, before finally having to return home, expecting to grovel, and just hoping he might have a chance to be a hired hand. 
This is about extremes. This is about extravagance, the extravagant love of the Father, the unexpected love of the Father. So who are you in this story? Are you the prodigal son, the one who left, the one who walked away? If we think of the father as God, are you the son who walked away from God, who maybe left for a while, left church, stopped praying, maybe never did have a close relationship with God or a healthy, good relationship in a church? Maybe you never had a church family, or maybe you did and decided that you could do it better yourself. Personally, that's the route I took. I grew up in church. I loved church. I prayed. I read scripture. I went to all the youth stuff. And then I went to college and I thought, you know, I can probably do this on my own. You know, hey, thank you, God, for being there for me. But I've decided I can do this myself. And I went 10 years without setting foot in a church, without reading scripture, without that relationship. And then I came back and it wasn't dramatic like this. It was gradual. It was a gradual realization that I, I wanted to come back. And then it was looking for churches, going to different churches and trying to figure out where God was calling me, where I fit in, where I felt at home. And then it was belonging to a church. And then it was hearing a call to ministry. And it was constantly growing in my relationship with God and my faith. So some of us are like that. We've walked away and come back. Others have never really known a good, healthy relationship with a church family and are just now starting to figure out what that looks like. And some of us are the faithful. Some of us have stayed the whole time. They were, they've grown up in church, born and raised in church, came through the doors whenever they were open. You're here every Sunday. You're worshiping online every single week. You, are, you have been faithful. You are that steadfast child. And you may see celebrations of people who are suddenly you know, back in church, or they may be talking about their stories of when they were pulled away and how glorious it was when they found Christ. You may hear stories of people who found God later in life and are now. It's such a good story that everybody gathers around and you may be feeling like, hey, I've been here this whole time. I've always gone to church. I've always had a relationship with God. Why doesn't the church celebrate me and my story? And to you, I say, listen to the words of God. You've been with me this whole time. You have enjoyed things that other people have missed. And we may be celebrating that people have found God now, but remember, they've not had the greatest path. There have been times where God could have been a huge help, a huge part of their life, where a church family could have been surrounding them, but they have missed that, and you have had that. These are really just two different life experiences with God, with church, with your faith. But neither is wrong. And there is not one that is better than another. So figure out what your faith story is. Where do you fall in this? Have you wandered away and come back? Have you been steadfast and faithful your whole life? Whatever your story is, acknowledge it and be proud of it and love it and share it so that others might hear your story and identify with it or learn something new. But remember, God doesn't just sit back and hope we come to know God better. God sees us coming and runs with open arms.
God knows we are here, those of us who are steadfast and faithful. God knows that and is with us always. Wherever your role is, whether God has run to you and embraced you and brought you back, or whether God has been at your side this whole time, that is your faith story. And let's talk about that, and let's celebrate that, and let's all share our particular stories with others so that they might see what we are talking about, so that somebody who is in the depths of the valleys and the pigsties of life might understand, hey, if I, if I start walking, God will run to meet me, embrace me, kiss me, celebrate that I am back. Amen. Let us now pray for and with one another. Gracious God, we have so many blessings. We have so much to be thankful for. And we celebrate the time that we have here with you. We are joyful when we catch glimpses of you at work in the world, when we see when we see you in creation, in the world around us, in nature, in the beauty of the skies and the flowers and the trees and the gulf. But Lord, even in the midst of joy, we still have lingering sorrows. We still have these worries that burden us. And we are so thankful that you stretch out your arms to help carry our burdens. Lord, there is so much going on in the world. We pray for the people of Ukraine. We pray for the people of Russia, those people who are protesting this war and being arrested and treated horribly, the people who are suffering, the people in Ukraine who are hiding, trying to just stay alive one more day, the people who are seeing their homes destroyed, their families separated, those who are fleeing and running to other countries for their own safety and those who cannot do that and must stay. We pray for that whole situation and all of the world leaders. We pray that you will speak wisdom and peace and love into their hearts and their minds, whisper it into their ears, grab them and shake them and shout it in their faces whatever it takes to bring an end to this war. Lord, we also pray for all of the people who are being affected by a new variant of COVID, watching numbers climb again, making adjustments, even as we are enjoying some newfound freedom in knowing how many people are vaccinated and how the numbers have dropped. It's an up and down situation. It always has been, and it may continue to be for some time. So be with us and keep us safe. Help us make the good, right decisions to protect not only our own health, but the health of those around us. We give you thanks for the doctors and nurses. We give you thanks for the vaccines and treatments and protocols that will help keep us safe. Lord, we pray for the people who were affected by tornadoes this week, all across the southeast, but especially our neighbors in New Orleans who were hit by such a large tornado. And our neighbors right here in Baldwin County in Somerdale and Robertsdale who also saw some damage from a smaller tornado. We pray for those people who are undergoing repairs, who are cleaning up, who are facing loss of livelihood and property. Lord, any other prayers that we have, you hear them. You know the groanings of our heart. You see us walking down the road and you run to us. We give you thanks for this. And we lift up all of our prayers in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.
This concludes our worship service. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back again next week. Quick reminder, next week is a communion Sunday, so be sure to have some bread or crackers and juice or wine ready so that you can share around the table with us. And don't forget too, we also have a prayer service every Thursday evening at 7 p.m. on our Facebook page. So I hope that you will join us for that as well. But for now, it's time to shut off our phones, turn off our computers and be extravagant, run toward people. Don't wait for them to come to you. Open your arms outstretched, tell your faith stories. Be excited as we do this, be bold. For as we part ways, we go with God the Creator, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, now and always. Amen. Children of the Lord said, Amen. Amen.